So last time, um, in the last lecture, we spoke um, a bit about different approaches to deviance, thinking about um, uh, uh, functional theories about how deviants may serve a critical function in society, um, thinking about anatomy and strain theory, and then finally about deviance as part of an opportunity structure, or what, what the opportunities are to commit deviance. Um, uh, and so I also want to add on to this the conflict theory of deviance. Um, and uh, and uh, the conflict theories of deviance, of which we'll have a few examples, like elite theory, suggest that deviance um, uh, is in part a product of power. Uh, and so they ask how it is that rules and norms are shaped by the power relations in the society, and how it is that powerful people get to determine what constitutes deviance. And through that capacity to determine what constitutes deviance, um, often dominate more subordinate groups. Uh, so, you know, let me give an example of this, an example of how a conflict theorist might think about deviance. It's an example that I brought up before um, about the sets of implications uh, around um, the use of crack cocaine cane. So in a previous lecture, when I spoke about um, moral panics, I used this as an example. But another way of viewing this example is the huge disparity in um, uh, uh, the consequence in the United States for um, being found with uh, powdered cocaine versus crack cocaine. And both are drugs, illegal drugs. Um, uh, 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 crack co cocaine, however, is really, really cheap, and powdered cocaine is very expensive. And the consequences of the doing the drugs is roughly the same in terms of behaviorally. Um, but the people who do these different kinds of drugs are very different kinds of people. So powdered cocaine um, is uh, sort of, in our cultural imagination, associated with Wall Street with traders, with um, uh, typically wealthy white men who use the drug recreationally, but also as a way to energize themselves. And crack cocaine is typically used by very poor people, um, poor whites, but also poor blacks. And, um, and the penalties for possessing either of these drugs are radically different from one another, so that the penalties for possession of crack cocaine are much more severe than the penalties of uh, having powdered cocaine. And a conflict theorist would look at this and say, you know, the rules that are set up around which drugs we punish severely and which drugs we don't have nothing to do with the character of the drugs and everything to do with the um, uh, 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 attributes of the people. So, you know, a conflict theorist would basically say the rules about how we punish drug offenses are rules that seek to continue the power relations of dominance of some groups over others. And so conflict theorists would look at the kinds of rules that exist uh, against, say, loitering. So rules against standing around in a neighborhood and say, these are not necessary rules or even norms. What they are are ways of punishing poor people, just finding ways to use the institute of the state, the power of the state, excuse me, to punish the poor. And so conflict theorists would exist in conflict with uh, the functionalist theorists and um, or, you know, there's ways to put them in parallel, but, but they would basically say, show me the rules of a society and I can show you who's powerful in that society. Um, you know, uh, that the present rules about the preservation of land and property ownership and the sacred nature of land and property ownership within a society, saying that like, you know, violations of property ownership are meant to be treated as severe violations of our social contract in a society, 
that is an expression of power of people who own property. Like they basically have instituted a set of rules to say, we own property, so property is valuable, and we're gonna punish the heck out of anybody who violates our property rights. And so conflict theorists consistently point to how the norms and punishments and rules of a society are not expressions of say, fairness or moral values, but instead expressions of power, expressions of who is in power in that society. And that those people will construct norms and rules to continue to advantage themselves. And so conflict theorists consider um, you know, uh, 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 a range of things. I'm, I'll actually skip the, the basic mask example for now. And um, uh, just think about how it is that rules are designed to benefit the rules. Um, an example of this would be, say, Jim Crow laws. Uh, and Jim Crow laws were laws in the South that preserved racial difference. And um, the argument is that uh, there's a group of people, maybe a minority, maybe not, who seek to use the legal apparatus to continue to advantage themselves. Um, some of this can be thought of as hegemony. And hegemony is uh, the idea that uh, what the ruling class or the ruling group does is find ways to make sure that their rule is supported through law and then through even the interests of those who are dominated. So people at the bottom of the social hierarchy have an interest in maintaining the very conditions of their domination. Um, uh, another is to think about this as the power elite. And this concept of the power elite comes from C. Wright Mills, a sociologist actually from my own institution of Columbia University, um, passed away in the 60s, so um, uh, 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 wrote some time ago, or 70s, well, 60s, late 60s, I think. Um, and um, uh, Mills said that there's a small group of people who are political, corporate, and military leaders. Um, uh, if you've ever heard of the phrase, the military industrial complex, a complex of military industry and political players, um, uh, this sort of comes from Mills. And Mills said that these group of men kind of come from the same sets of schools. They have similar training. They have similar law uh, uh, families. And so the laws that they construct reflect their own understandings of the world. In Mills's approach, um, the elite of a society come from very particular families and institutions. And the impact of that, the implication of that, is that those elite um, uh, construct laws and expectations within a society that reflect their own interests, that sort of um, show or reflect the background that they have. Now, this is a way of thinking about deviance that doesn't say like, well, um, obviously, like if someone harm, physically harms someone else, we need to punish it, that this is like a universal human rule. Instead, it says again and again, that the laws of a society are laws based in the power relations of that society. And that our notions of things that are inherently good are, in fact, a relation of a, 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 a reflection of power relationships. And you know, particularly in the West and the United States, that the deep attention to property rights is, in part, a justification of capitalism. And so, this the enormous value that we place upon property and the ways in which we punish people who violate property rights, theft and other kinds of things, is a reflection of a capitalist orientation, the value of private property. Um, and that that is, from the power elite or the conflict theory perspective, an expression of power. Um, that 
we could organize our societies differently. There could be ways in um, where, say, the property rights are not seen as, as important. Um, uh, and that that would lead to a different set of power relationships and a different set of rules. Um, uh, we also have interactionalist uh, theories of difference. Um, uh, and these theories ask how deviance in part is constituted, not identified in a bigger way. Um, and one example um, of something like this is uh, the concept of stigma. And stigma is a phenomenon whereby someone is socially discredited. It's sometimes thought of as a uh, spoiled identity. Um, so there are different kinds of identities that we shun, that we stigmatize. Um, and uh, uh, this idea of a spoiled identity um, uh, is one where the person can never fully be accepted, socially accepted. And stigma are typically social constructions. Um, so, you know, there are some times where we might stigmatize individuals um, because of uh, physical attributes that they have. Um, so there's a stigmatization, for example, of obesity. Uh, people who are overweight may experience high degrees of stigmatization, and it's sort of a spoiled or socially discredited identity of that person. Um, and, uh, but there are other kinds of stigma um, that are very difficult for people to escape and um, uh, that we sort of sustain through a social construction of idea that that kind of identity is, is deeply spoiled. So I'll give an example of this. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may not. Um, there's a classic uh, book uh, by Nathaniel Hawthorne called The Scarlet Letter. And in it, Scarlet Letter has a main character, Esther Prynne, and she uh, is forced to wear a scarlet letter. Um, and that scarlet letter is a bright red letter a on her, uh, which reflects her um, having a child out of wedlock. Uh, and so um, uh, having a child without being married. And this is a book that's written in the 19th century, so it's not um, written in the contemporary period. Um, but having a child without being married was, at the time, a deeply stigmatizing identity. So it was an identity that was seen as spoiled. And as a spoiled identity, something that you could never escape. Esther Prynne had to always wear upon her clothing this scarlet letter, this red letter of an A, to remind the community of the huge violation in their eyes of what she had done. Now, when I say that this is a social construction, what I mean is that um, there's a community group, there's a group, community um, uh, that sort of decided that this identity is something that is inescapable. Scholars have argued about a range of stigmatized identities, um, uh, where in some societies having a working class background is deeply, deeply stigmatized. So if you have a particular kind of accent, um, that can be stigmatized. Um, where if you have a certain kind of skin color, it could be stigmatized. So certain skin tones can be part of stigmatized identities. Um, uh, uh, some scholars have recently argued that having been formally incarcerated, at some point in time, being in the penal system is a stigmatized identity. It's an identity that is forever rotten or spoiled, not because it's inherently so, but because we have constructed or understood the identity in that way. And these processes of stigmatization are processes of interaction. So today, the um, Esther Prynne, having a child out of wedlock, isn't nearly as much of a stigmatized identity as it used to be. So these things can transform over time, although there still is a certain degree of stigma to having that particular kind of identity. Um, it used to be the case and still is in some places um, and in some communities that being of the LGBTQ community, identifying as gay was part of being a member of a stigmatized identity group. And so we can see how um, deviance uh, um, 
as understood as stigma is something that is socially constituted. It's not inherent to the act itself, but it's instead something that we collectively do and reproduce and often use structures or institutions or organizations to help reaffirm that stigmatization process. Um, finally, uh, we can look at deviance as um, a differential association. Uh, and this relates to our earlier discussions of thinking about deviance um, uh, in light of opportunity theory. Um, so you may recall opportunity theory uh, was partially the um, idea that deviance can happen in part based on an opportunity. But differential association um, suggests that deviance is learned just like any other behavior. Um, and that deviance is something that we develop and learn over time. And I'll talk about this a bit more in a different lecture where I talk about um, Howard Becker's classic article, Becoming a Marijuana User. And in that paper, uh, what Howard Becker does is argue that in order to learn how to properly smoke marijuana, it's not that you have an inherent quality to you that makes you want to, to smoke marijuana. Instead, what it is, is that you learn how to smoke marijuana. You learn how to categorize the experience as enjoyable. And so this is sort of a, a theory where you say like, it's not actually the case that people have an inherent quality to them, like a criminal personality and that that criminal personality creates them, their deviant acts. So that criminal personalities are the people who are most likely to deviate. Instead, it's that you have differential association, that different kinds of people begin to participate in certain sorts of things, and then those things resonate with them as part of a social process, not an inherent um, psychological or uh, process or process of inherent personality. These theories sought to challenge um, the idea of uh, deviance as being a personality trait that people are born with. Um, and I want you to recognize that um, uh, the idea of deviance as a personality trait that people are born with has a strong um, uh, uh, current in our in our understanding of deviance. So, for example, um, if you look at like cop dramas, dramas about you know police forces, often they have a theory of deviance of the deviant person as being somehow like biologically bad. That there's something inherent to them that is pathological and is in some way unchangeable, not transformable. Um, what differential association suggests is that that's not really true. It's not the case that these people are inherently broken um, or uh, that there's some deep quality in them that makes them always be deviant. Instead, most people learn deviant behavior. They learn them through a series of experiences that they have. Um, I realize we're covering a lot of ground, but this will be kind of the final one. Um, uh, uh, the final, final is control theory, which is related to anime. Um, and uh, the idea of control theory is that deviance is caused by the weakening of social bonds. The unmooring of social connection opens a path to deviant behavior. Um, and uh, the, I, the basis of this theory is that there are four basic bonds that we can have that will keep us or prevent us from engaging in deviant behavior. Those four are attachment, commitment, involvement, and belief. Being attached to other people. Um, so uh, this could be attached through obligations, could be attached through, so, um, uh, but having some existing social tie is the idea. Having a commitment to that. So you could have a social tie with someone but you could be willing to abandon that 
social tie at any time. So you guys may be in some relationships where you have an attachment to somebody, but actually you're not that committed to them. You'd be totally willing to abandon them um, um, uh, if, if the opportunity arose or if something better came along. So not only are you attached to someone, you're committed to that attachment, um, that you are involved together. So this brings in a kind of practice element to the theory. So just being committed to someone doesn't really provide enough of a foundation of controlling you um, and controlling you has a positive implication. Um, you actually have to do things together. So you may have a friend that you are actually pretty committed to, but that you haven't seen in a long time, that you haven't been involved in. And that could undermine both your attachment and your commitment to that person. And so, you know, your sentiment is not enough. The existence of a tie and the commitment to the tie is not enough. You actually have to do things together. So, um, you know, couples know this. They like, you know, couples will often do things like have a date night. And the idea there is like the couple may see each other all the time. They may be attached and committed, but unless they engage in an activity together, the, the relationship could be deeply undermined. And so, or with friends, you may say like, I haven't seen you in a long time, let's go do something together. Part of what you're saying is that like, by doing things together, we reaffirm our commitment to it. And then finally, belief. People have to have some kind of shared belief, um, shared set of understandings about the world. These different elements, attachment, commitment, involvement, involvement, and belief, serve as the foundational blocks of control theory, of social control. And in, instead of thinking of social control as like a straitjacket that's totally limiting you from being able to do what you really want, social control here is um, thought of in positive ways. It helps integrate you into groups. And that integration into groups means that you're less likely to engage in deviant behavior. Um, uh, final is um, an I the idea of labeling theory, where deviance isn't rooted in the act itself. And as you'll note, many of these theories are related to one another. Um, and deviance is instead created by those who label an action as deviant. So this is tied to the conflict theory, power elite um, theory. Um, and that deviance is constantly negotiated. Um, uh, and that there are different kinds of, of deviance that we all might engage with. The first is primary deviance, which is the first act of the deviance. And then the secondary deviance is accepting that deviance as part of your identity. And so um, uh, these different kinds of uh, uh, experiences of deviance, engaging in a deviant act and then labeling that act as meaningful for you, um, help us understand, again, the social process of deviance. Now, all of this has presented deviance so far in maybe somewhat negative terms, not always. And the conflict theory perspective suggests that deviance isn't really inherently negative. But I want you to think for a moment about positive deviance. And, you know, are there um, uh, instances of deviance where there's some among us who are weird or strange or deviate from the norm, but that that deviance has a positive effect? And this is kind of a cultural trope, um, particularly in the United States, that like um, someone like Albert Einstein had positive deviance. He quote unquote thought differently than other people. And through his deviation from the modes of understanding that others had, uh, he transformed our understanding of physics. And not just in doing that, transformed our understanding of what space is and what time is. Really, really profound. Um, you know, uh, uh, and so uh, the idea here is that deviance maybe isn't always bad. It might not be something negative, um, but that sometimes if everyone is conforming to a norm, 
there's real opportunities to sort of suggest, what if we thought about this differently? So, um, and you know, we often present like athletes, models, geniuses as examples of this. Everyone's doing something in one particular way and I'm going to innovate how I do it. I'm gonna change the way in which people do this. And by doing that, I'm making that change, I'm gonna like deviate from the norm, but transform the world. So, you know, if you think about our phones, for example, so this is my phone, um, there's no keypad on my phone. And, you know, the, somebody had the idea at some point in time, um, uh, what, um, uh, what, like, what if we just got rid of the keypad on the phone? Like, what if we, instead of like our Blackberries, which used to have these little foam buttons on them, what if we got rid of them? And one way to think about this is that, like, that person deviated from, the norm or the expected form of action and try to do something different and in doing something different um, transformed our conditions of understanding of what might be possible and that that positive deviance generated a new norm a new set of uh, expectations or standards so this theory says that like you know societies frequently um, uh, herald some people as engaging in positive deviance. Some people are denounced for this. They're burned at the stake. They're treated as heretics. They're expelled. Um, and there's plenty of examples of scientists who um, deviated from the accepted norms of uh, the society at the time who were correct and were, who were punished and sometimes killed for presenting ideas like the earth is not the center of the universe. It actually revolves around the sun this was a deviant or a heretical idea to the Catholic Church, which resulted in the killing of some scientists because of that. And so that positive deviance could result in really negative outcomes for the person. Um, some have argued that as technology advances, as our te technological foundation of society transforms, deviant people are going to be able to find each other. And they'll soon realize that deviance is just a matter of context. And so that we should think about deviance in most instances as just the creation of subcultures or subcommunities. What I want you to take away from most of this is that like, it's kind of complicated to understand what deviance is. Um, the first pass, it seems pretty obvious that um, deviance is like a bad thing. Um, it's the breaking of a law. Um, and while there are certainly some laws that we would think of as, as like being something we should never break, when we begin to sort of peel the layers off this, we see how in many instances, um, what deviance is, is a, uh, it's a moving away from a norm, an expectation for how it is that we should act, but that those norms are typically socially constituted. Um, that doesn't mean they're not real. It just means that there's a social process of creating the norms. And that we might want to interrogate that social process of creating those norms and question um, uh, some of uh, why it is that some things are normative and some, thing, some things that are, are, other things are not. I think that there's much to be said for certain elements of conflict theory. Um, and particular those elements of conflict theory that view the understanding of deviance as a violation of a norm that is a norm that exists in part to justify existing power relationships. Or more succinctly, that many of the definitions of deviance that we have are in fact expressions of power. But not all of them are. And, um, uh, some of the most uh, consequential forms of deviance aren't just an expression of power, but can be an expression of violence. And those are things that we need to be deeply attentive to. And so in the next set of lectures, or the next lecture, we'll talk about crime and violence, moving beyond forms of deviance like um, being a member of the LGBT community or homosexuality, moving beyond 
things like having a child out of wedlock or you know, becoming a child without being married, um, moving beyond things like acceptable behaviors that aren't really super consequential and get down to what about those behaviors that are deeply consequential? What about doing violence to other people? Why does that happen and how can we understand?